We all know that burning gasoline for transportation contributes significantly to an oncoming global calamity, climate change. We also know that switching to electric vehicles or EVs can improve the situation. And I bet all of you, like me, care about the environment, and most of you, like me, don't own an electric vehicle. I'm pretty confident about this because I know that electric vehicles make up less than a percent of all the automobiles on the road today. So unless there is a small fraction of a person out in the audience who owns an electric vehicle, I think this is a pretty safe assumption. Now, I have my reasons why I don't own an electric vehicle. I live in the city, I don't have a garage, so I can't charge at home. I don't like waiting longer than three minutes at a gas station to refuel. I like knowing I can go on long trips. I don't want to deal with the logistics of charging stations. And owning an electric vehicle right now seems as if I would be paying substantially more for significantly less. So if some of my reasons are also some of your reasons why you don't have an electric vehicle, it doesn't bode well for the environment because each one of those is a separate issue that is yet to be addressed. I've been a research scientist for over 13 years, and I have the luxury of imagining possible solutions long before most even get to consider them. In fact, every moment of the day I think of solutions. It's what I do. But every now and then, I get to experience the completely unexpected, and it is extremely refreshing. Seven years ago, I was having a series of conceptual conversations with a colleague of mine about her work in heat transfer nanofluids. To explain, a nanofluid is a fluid that has billions and billions of nanoparticles mixed into it, and these tiny particles can imbue their material properties into the fluid, and the fluid, in turn, can begin to exhibit the material behavior of the solid. My colleague was pumping her fluid across a hot surface, and the fluid would absorb the heat from this hot surface. And by measuring how the fluid would cool down, she could determine the effect the nanoparticles were having on the thermal efficiency of the fluid. She found in some cases that by adding the nanoparticles to her fluid, she could improve its thermal efficiency by 80%, which is a lot when you consider that industry typically fights for only 5% incremental improvements in a product's performance. And from her results, a question arose. If the nanofluid that she was testing was being pumped in her apparatus from a point A to a point B, and we know that heat is actually just a form of thermal energy, were there other forms of energy that could also be transported in this fashion? How about electrical energy storage and transport? Could that be transported from point A to point B in a nanofluid using nanoparticles made from rechargeable battery materials? So we formed a research group to investigate. Battery materials, regardless if they make up the positive side or the negative side, they experience a morphological change when they're charged and they're discharged. When you go home and you plug a battery into your charger, an electron is actually physically driven into the material at the atomic level. And the atoms in the material, they need to separate a little bit. They need to adjust to accommodate this electron. And one way that we can see this happening is by using x-rays. Sort of like x-raying your luggage at the airport to see the contents inside. But in our case, we needed to use a particle accelerator to generate the x-rays and use very specialized techniques to see what was happening at the atomic level. So, we wrote a series of experimental proposals to use one of the largest x-ray sources in the world, utilizing this exact type of experiment. And we began pumping 
our nanofluid with these rechargeable battery particles in it to see if, in fact, we could charge and discharge those particles, and we could. And using the x-rays, we were able to probe the process in real time, probe the system as it occurred. Well, this was a very exciting result, because previously I spoke of transporting thermal energy from point A to point B. But here, we were transporting electrical energy storage and transport in a fluid from point A to point B. And normally, when you're transporting electrical energy the way we know it, you do it in a wire. You don't do it in a fluid. There's something subtly unique about this concept. And then the unexpected happened. With every experiment to follow, we actively sought for areas for further development until the potential of liquid energy storage, it came into focus for us. I want everyone here to consider their cell phones. That inside are solid battery material, solid constructs. And they absorb energy and they extract energy thousands of times, over and over and over, cycling back and forth, back and forth, throughout their entire useful life. Battery store electrical energy, you all know this. There's nothing new there. But there are other types of battery outside of that familiar format. Here. This is a battery too. Even though we identify with those solid battery constructs that are in your cell phones, this is a bunch of lemons powering a clock. And you know, when life serves you lemons, you Make a battery, right. <laughs> There's another type of uh, battery, and I'm just going to describe it for you. It's called a flow battery. And a flow battery is a type of battery that actually has these massive tree trunk size tanks. And one tank has got a positive fluid in it, and the other tank has a negative fluid in it. And there's a reaction chamber that basically sits between them. And depending on the way in which you flow it across this reaction chamber will determine whether it's going to store electrical energy or it's going to give up electrical energy. And it's utilized to minimize brownout scenarios when everyone comes home in hot summer months, everyone turns on their air conditioner. Well, this sort of levelizes that because if you don't use batteries in this fashion, you will waste a lot of energy because you'll get these brownout scenarios and something has to compensate for it. Now, one reason you all aren't walking around with lemons in your pockets connected to your cell phones or you're putting stationary storage flow batteries on the back of trailers hitched to your EVs is they actually don't store a lot of energy. And it is only those batteries that you're familiar with that are in your cell phones that have the energy storage and the energy density to actually push an electric vehicle 240 miles per charge. So the question actually is, is can a format change from those solid battery materials into a liquid one do better? And if so, what could be accomplished? Now I want to talk to you a little bit about gasoline. Gasoline functionally is an amazing thing. It is a high energy density liquid fuel. And it is transportable from point A to point B via flow and fuel pumps. It doesn't freeze. It's extremely high energy dense and it's volatile. All you need is a spark to get out its energy and it can store a lot of energy in those chemical bonds. It's one of those materials that if nature did not supply gasoline for us, we would want to invent something this good. And just as electrical energy is transported from the generators to the grid, to the transformers, to the homes, to the outlets, gasoline is transported from oil rigs, refineries, pipelines, tanker cars, the gas station, and then to your pump. And the convenience of gasoline cannot be understated, overstated. It is pumpable. It is flowable, and for these reasons, it occupies a huge space in the U.S. energy portfolio. 
Now, you'll notice in the red section, 71% of petroleum goes towards transportation, specifically for those reasons I previously spoke of. It's functional. It's hard to imagine anything other than the three-minute refueling. It's hard to imagine anything other than gasoline's reliability, other than gasoline's relatively low cost. There is just one glaring modern 21st century issue, and that is burning gasoline for transportation is responsible for 30% of all CO2 production, and CO2 causes climate change. Now, someone could say, hey, just electrify transportation. You don't have to worry about burning petroleum anymore. And there's a few points I want to make here. The first is this. If we were to electrify transportation, you can see in the blue section that represents electricity generation. So most of the red would become blue. And what that means is you would be doubling up on the necessity to build more electricity generation. That means we would have to double up on the amount of coal plants that we presently use to generate the electricity. And burning coal produces 137% more CO2 than burning gasoline. So that doesn't help that much. Then there's the question of grid capacity. If everyone came home on a hot summer day, turned on their air conditioner, opened the refrigerator, popped the beer, turned on their TV, turned on the lights, and plugged their automobile, their electric vehicle in for recharging, you would have transformers that would be shutting down everywhere. Now, there is a proposed solution to this issue, and it goes something like this. If the electric vehicles are capable of talking to the meters at the home, and the meters at the home are capable of talking to the transformers, and the transformers can talk to the grid, then the grid can tell the automobile when it's most convenient for it to charge the automobile. You would no longer be free to just come home and plug your electric vehicle in to charge whenever it was convenient for you. This means, though, there would need to be more infrastructure leading to more cost. And the other point I want to make is presently it takes 60 times longer to fully recharge an electric vehicle than it does the three minutes to refuel it right now. And that amount of time would be preclusive to meet the local demand in urban areas. The aggregate footprint to do that in an urban area would be massive. These are some of the issues related to simply electrifying transportation. Electrification, it faces headwinds from infrastructure issues, consumer issues, and strategy issues. However, at approximately 8%, so 8 out of every 100 people, if they owned electric vehicles, a business argument could be made to produce them, and companies would make a profit producing them. In order to combat global climate change, you need closer to 50% EV penetration. 50 out of every 100 people need to be driving an electric vehicle. And generation sources need to be created and invented that don't burn fossil fuels in a way to transport energy that won't crash the grid. And urban areas can't be precluded because it takes so much longer to charge. Petroleum companies presently own the transportation market. And they're not simply going to give it up to the electric utilities. They're going to fight tooth and nail to keep their markets. And utility companies presently aren't positioned to take over anyways. But climate change, it doesn't care about any of this. It doesn't care about strategy issues. It doesn't care about infrastructure issues. It's just going to keep accelerating and keep going forward. Until, until the end. Now, imagine a different possibility where batteries are made of high-energy-density rechargeable fluids. 
And large tanks can sit at solar farms and wind farms. And the fluids could be charged on site and first transported by tanker car, rail car, and depots to refilling stations where one can imagine electric vehicles simply pump in fresh charged liquid and pump out the discharged liquid to be recharged at the station or wherever and whenever is most convenient for the infrastructure that we already have. Does this solve many of those issues? Does the format change from a solid into a liquid address this issue? Does this scenario give oil companies the impetus to pivot because they can hold on to their markets? They have the technological advantage already of transporting liquid fuel. <laughs> When we began this work, this was not what we were going after. <laughs> we were simply following the breadcrumbs, studying the basic nature of this new liquid energy format. Only after we proved the concepts in our early experiments did we begin to understand the potential of what liquid energy storage actually is. Can we make a high energy density battery a composite liquid, have the same low operational temperatures? Can we make it flow with pumps and transport it in that fashion? Yes, and we've patented the technology and we've shown it in its, all its pieces. A nanoelectrofuel flow battery is a stable nanoparticle suspension of the same high energy density materials that you are already familiar with, that are already in those cell phones. They're already in mass production. They're already utilized around the world. They're already used to combat global climate change. A NEF battery is a type of battery that attempts to merge the solid formats into the flow battery formats into one singular functional form. This is how we see it. The transportation of electrical energy without a grid in a fluid not only addresses the core issues, but it fundamentally occupies the same space as gasoline. No longer do grid structures need to be built to the solar farms and the wind farms. Instead of oil being pumped from the ground and into pipelines, wind farms could be pumping energy into pipelines. Instead of pumping gasoline into internal combustion engines, pumps could be pumping electrified fluid. Energy storage decouples demand from generation. And NEF type of technologies, it decouples the energy transport from the grid. None of this potential was sought. None of this overarching vision was predetermined. A simple change of format from those high energy density materials that you are all familiar with into just a liquid nanofluid opened up an entire area of application, innovation. When we started this work, we simply did it because we were curious. Now, now we're going to build it. Thank you.